everybody. Hi, I'm Christy Ball, and this is the perfect plan. Christmas time in 1989, and my family of five was living in a single wide trailer in Albany, Georgia. We'd been there for a whopping six months when my parents decided it was time to go back to California. We had lived in Mississippi, Alabama, Florida, Georgia, Oklahoma, and California in most of these states more than once. In these states, we had lived in Pascagoula, Tuscaloosa, Tampa, humid, sleepy places where your nearest neighbor is a mile or two down the road to bustling metropolises where the homeless sleep on concrete. Getting back to California wasn't as easy as the decision to come back was. We didn't have two nickels to rub together, much less the cash it would take to rent a moving truck and move back across the country. In my family, making ends meet means stealing from Peter to pay Paul. And sometimes it means breaking the law outright. So it wasn't a surprise when my father rented a large rider truck for an in-town rental and then drove the truck across the country instead. <laughs> The cops in El Cajon noticed a rider truck with Georgia plates was driving around, ran those plates, found out the vehicle was stolen, surrounded my dad with guys in black who threw him to the ground and held guns to his head. He was arrested on the spot and sent back to Georgia where he spent the next six months in jail for grand theft auto. From eight to four, Monday through Friday, mom worked as a secretary at Woman's World, then raced to Kmart where she worked from five to 10 in customer desperation. <laughs> Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Saturday nights, she, wait she waitressed the third shift at Denny's. On her 21 hour days, she didn't sleep in her car like one might expect to catch a few Zs between jobs. Instead, my mom maintained her sanity by devouring romance novels, finding comfort in the imaginary arms of rugged rogues and sexpot savages. <laughs> While mom kept food on the table, I took over her role in the house. On school days, I dragged my sisters out of bed and walked to Chase Elementary where I went to school myself. After school, I cleaned the house, made dinner, helped my sisters with homework, and put them to bed. My sisters were in kindergarten and first grade, so helping them with homework was easy and most dinners consisted of adding milk to mystery packets of Hamburger Helper. <laughs> I met my first true best friend on my first day of school at Chase Elementary. It was February 26, 1990. While I was waiting in the office for a chaperone to take me to class, in walks this blonde haired white girl with her mother. It was rare to see another mother reach the six feet and one inches my mother reaches, so I stared at them. <laughs> Hi, we would like to enroll my daughter Brenda in the sixth grade. At first I wasn't sure I heard correctly, so I leaned in closer. I couldn't believe my luck. Brenda, a Navy transplant from Connecticut, just happened to start Mr. Moen's sixth grade class on the exact same day as me in the middle of the school year. As soon as her mother left the office, I pshhed her. <laughs> hey, yeah, you. <laughs> Is this your first day? Are you new? She looked at me for a second, stunned. Why was this strange girl talking to her? <laughs> she must have decided I was harmless because she suddenly smiled and said it was. By the time we walked from that office to Mr. Moen's class on the first day, we were inseparable. As if scoring a soulmate wasn't already a blessing, Brenda's dad managed a small apartment complex and the unit right beneath hers was vacant. The potential for fun was limitless. The night before the apartment opened up, Brenda and I set to strategizing a plan to convince my mom to move again. We presented her with several points, each more persuasive than the one before, explaining in a very serious fashion why my family just had to live beneath her family. 
Perhaps it was our humorous presentation or how serious we took ourselves, or maybe it's because my mom could never say no to her kids. She caved in and we moved to Leslie Avenue right off Chase. Moving to Leslie Avenue was like moving to a whole new country. One that really knew how to party. <laughs> Shoes tied together, thrown over power lines, windows without screens. Yeah, I'd seen that before. But now the men who hung out those windows showed their appreciation to passing women with new forms of flattery. Hey, mamacita. <laughs> The tiny old lady who lived next door to me had an entire convenience store in her apartment. <laughs> she sold various kinds of chile dipped Mexican candy for a quarter, cans of Pepsi, and what became my favorite, chicharrones con chile, <laughs> for 50 cents. I had seen cowboys drive trucks before, but now there were these guys with, who wore super large, extra mega cowboy hats. And they decked out the perimeter of their trucks with these really cool, colorful lights. At night, you knew when these workers were coming home long before you saw their truck. The horns that open every ballad in Norteña music would herald their arrival, and then right before they came into view, a car horn would play. <laughs> It was like coming home with some kind of celebration every night. If the sun was up, the children were outside and they were running around. They were having a good time, playing soccer, laughing like they just heard what had to be the funniest joke in the entire world. Teasing and straight up harassment were the norm. <laughs> The boys thought it, it was hysterical to teach Brenda and I curse words like pinche pendejo <laughs> and forbidden phrases like chinga tu madre. <laughs> I remember the first time I repeated the forbidden phrase chinga tu madre, I had, which translates essentially to go fuck your mother. I had no idea what I was saying. <laughs> But I knew it was really bad when the kids scattered in all directions, covering their mouths, pointing at me like I just took a poop in public. <laughs> but that's how everything was on Leslie. Everything was fun or funny. Living, everybody was cracking jokes and everybody had a nickname. Beto, Nacho, Neto, Pepe. Living right across from Brenda and I were Chucho, AKA Jesus, AKA Angel with the light green eyes. <laughs> and Victor, sometimes called Manolo. Brenda noticed Angel and I noticed Victor. Victor was 16 years old and from Guerrero. He had crossed the border just a year before and had become fully bilingual in that time. He went, he went to El Cajon High School. He drove a car. Every move he made, whether diving in the pool or sprinting to score a goal, was precise. <laughs> Victor had purpose. <laughs> and his dark maple skin, thick hair the color of midnight, and badass demeanor, became the cover of my very own romance novel. <laughs> I buzzed around Victor for weeks for him to notice me. I peeked out my kitchen window, which felt like for hours, so that when he was outside, I was outside. <laughs> I just happened to be sitting on the stairs when he was in the parking lot kicking the soccer ball. I blasted digital undergrounds, do what you like, ooh, ooh, see guys and girls, ooh, right? <laughs> Out my living room and laughed uncontrollably for no good reason so that Brenda, I mean, so that Victor and Angel would think that we were fun girls. <laughs> it worked. Vic, Brenda, Angel, and I, we started hanging out on purpose. 
We went to Renette Park to play basketball for hours. We did cannonballs and backflips in the pool until chlorine burned our eyes. On warm summer nights, we'd sneak out of our apartments in the middle of the night, steal Victor's parents' car, and then drive up to Mount Helix to stargaze. <laughs> After weeks of flirtation, I finally found the courage to find out if Victor liked me like that. <laughs> courage of a conspired sort, of course. Uh, Brenda had to talk to Angel, who then Angel had to talk to Victor. <laughs> the next night, I walked to the front of the complex, my stomach churling and spittle and the cracks of my mouth. He was waiting for me. We only had moments before we both had to go inside. As I approached him, I noticed he looked queasy and unsure of himself. And I remember thinking how strange that was because you never saw Victor look queasy or unsure of anything. He was the best. <laughs> he mumbled something under his breath and reached for my hand. Then in a quiet, gentle voice, he said, or asked, will you be my girl? I fell hard. <laughs> he didn't say, so you want to be my girlfriend? <laughs> like it was my choice or like he was doing me a favor. No, his choice of words captured the sentiment behind every love jam on the radio. He asked me to be his girl. And that was exactly what I was going to be. <laughs> Keep in mind, yes, I'm 12 years old, but I'm also... <laughs> I'm also 5'9", five 5'9", nine, five like I am now, with the full voluptuous body of a woman, double Ds, hips and lips. <laughs> Biologically speaking, I'm right on time for a 16-year-old. <laughs> Things started off light, holding hands, kissing without tongue, and some over-the-shirt petting. My dad was getting out of jail soon. And even though my mother warned him about the changes that had taken place in his absence, that in fact his little girl wasn't so little anymore, and she had developed a strong relationship with an older boy, my dad just couldn't wrap his mind around what my mother was saying. I remember the first time when he walked through the door. My dad seemed even taller than his six foot four frame. He looked more worn and his skin was darker, which I remember thinking was really odd because he'd just gotten out of jail. A beast or a man, or maybe a tiny bit of both, he was scary. I didn't want him to feel bad, so I went to him and hugged him tightly. We just stood there, holding on, erasing the months apart. When we finally let go, he turned to my mother and with a damn, you weren't kidding, he broke the ice. <laughs> We were laughing within minutes of his return. My dad noticed pretty quickly during those first few weeks that a new guy had taken his place in my life. Things were way more intense with Victor than he had imagined, and he wanted to put an end to that relationship. But Victor had been there for me when I needed someone, and in my dad's absence, I had become a new creature. To me, there was no going back to the days before dad went to jail. And after being away for six months, the last thing my dad wanted to do was to put space between us again. So, for better or for worse, he backed off. I had been curious about what happens in the adult bedroom since at least the age of six, <laughs> when my curiosity, and my curiosity always got me into trouble. <laughs> when I was six, my dad tanned my hide as he likes to say it, when he found me and a neighbor boy in the parents' closet playing, I'll show you mine if you show me yours. <laughs> mine was being shown when dad walked in. <laughs> Later, when I was nine, I took a different neighbor into my parents' bedroom where we pressed our closed mouths and tight bodies washboard against each other. We wanted to laminate. 
not fornicates. I got caught when I did that too. <laughs> well, Victor and I had been boyfriend and girlfriend for about a year when dry humping became more frustration than fun for me. As our one year anniversary approached, I decided the greatest gift we could give to each other was our virginities. Vic wasn't so sure, but I didn't want to wait anymore. Without Victor's knowledge, I reached out to his uncle who was an alcoholic. He lived in the same apartment complex as we did and had a wicked sense of humor. It didn't take much to convince him. I gave him my chore money to book us a room at the Days Inn at the bottom of the hill by Grossmont High School. <laughs> yes, I was 13 now, and Victor was 17, but I wanted our anniversary night to be special. <laughs> I didn't want to rush the experience, and I certainly didn't want anyone to walk in. I wanted the fireworks I read about in my mother's steamy novels. <laughs> the night we shed our virginities didn't start off smooth like the sex I read about in Harlan Quinn romance novels. Candles, shower sex, on the floor, over the chair, yeah, that happened. <laughs> but I wasn't having sex with an experienced lover. Victor was a virgin too, and he didn't know how to prepare me. As he entered me for the first time, I clamped down like a vice grip and just started to cry. This was not the throbbing <laughs> described in my mother's <laughs> novels. <laughs> this felt like I was being split into two. <laughs> but Victor stopped. I remember thinking that most guys would have just taken what was being offered, just pushed forward, tears be damned. But not Victor. He stilled every muscle in his body, traced a tear down my face and gently whispered, if you want to stop, we can. My mother always taught us girls that our bodies are special and that we should only share them with special people with whom we are in love. She also told us that we could tell her anything. In fact, the rule of the house was, I don't care what you've done, you'd better tell mom before someone else does. So we had a very open relationship, not so open that I told her before I had sex with Victor, <laughs> but open enough that I told her the very next morning. <laughs> I walked in the front door, dropped my bag, and asked mom if we could go to Taco Bell. <laughs> my mom was raised to behave in public and handle her private business at home. So asking her to Taco Bell was really a strategy on my part, as nobody takes Southern manners more seriously than she does. We sat down in a booth, and I just jumped right in. Mom, I wasn't with Perosi last night. This is where my dad had dropped me off. She paused and took a breath. OK, where were you? I was with Victor. OK, what were you doing <laughs> with Victor? Her brow crinkled. Mom. I looked her straight in her eyes. In a split second, I knew at once that she was stalling and that I just had to say it. We were at the day's end. We slept together. <laughs> Bam! My mother burst into tears. <laughs> My mother is an interesting mix of modern and traditional woman. She handles all the money in our family, but she also thinks a woman should serve her man his plate. It was important to my mom that I be a virgin bride like she was when she married her first husband. Red faced, tears just free falling right there in the Taco Bell. She sputtered, I wanted, but I wanted you to be a virgin. But I cut her off. I cut her off. I knew this was coming, and I had thought about it. I had it all figured out. In my view, as long as I married Victor someday, it still counted. I hadn't broken her heart, and I was still a good girl. Mom, it was our year anniversary, and one day I am going to marry Victor. It's okay, I promised her. My mom turned back to me, drying her eyes. Her mind started working again. Okay, I'm glad you told me. 
I wish you would have waited, but I'm not completely surprised. You do spend quite a bit of time with Victor. A few regular breaths filled the air as my mom regained composure. Were you safe? She asked. I didn't want my first time to be with a condom. In my view, the condom would get in the way of our magical experience. It wouldn't be the real thing if I didn't feel him. A few months earlier, I had overheard my mom and her sister talking about this form of birth control called the rhythm method. If a woman has sex within 10 days of the last day of her period, she can't get pregnant. I was feeling pretty great right about then, being open with my mom like I always promised her I would, telling her I'd done my research. These were the moves of a responsible person. Her face said otherwise. Honey, you mean within 10 days of the first day of your period, not the last, and even that's not foolproof. If you do it within 10 days of the last day of your period, you're actually doing it when you are the most fertile. Now, I was crying. (laughs) I thought I was so grown up that I had executed the perfect plan. A few days later, my mother's fear was confirmed. I had gotten pregnant the very first time I had sex. (laughs) 